Welcome to the behavioral sciences section of our practice MCAT kind of questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 66 to 70. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 66, it says Jamie is five years old. Though he understands the importance of sharing, he is often egocentric when playing with friends. According to Piaget's cognitive developmental stages, in which stage is Jamie? So we have someone that's five years old. They understand the importance of sharing, but they are egocentric. So they can't really empathize with others and understand their point of view. They focus on just themselves. So which stage of Piaget's development is Jamie in? This is option B, the pre-operational stage. So this requires knowledge of these different stages according to Piaget. In the pre-operational stage, children, they can use symbols to think and communicate. But during the stage, they find it difficult to understand others' views and wishes. And that's why they are egocentric. In question 67, it says, what type of study would be best suited to understand the association between socioeconomic status and life expectancy in a country? So we want a type of study and we want to link or look at the association between socioeconomic status and life expectancy. So let's go through each of these studies one by one. Option A, a randomized control study. This is a very strong and powerful type of study where you randomly assign your individuals into different groups and then look at the outcome. However, realistically, this is not eth eth ethically sound because you can't put someone in a group in which they have a low socioeconomic status and then see what the outcome on their health is. That's just not ethical. So because of that, we're going to remove this option. If it was a different case, not something really dealing with humans, then or not something as severe, then maybe we could do a randomized control study. But in this case, we'll rule it out. Option B, a cohort study. This is when we can take a cohort, which is a group that we're looking at, and then track those individuals longitudinally, so over a period of time. But we don't have to use this type because it would take a long time to complete, and instead we can look at it at a certain point of in time, or we can look at it retrospectively instead. So we don't. We can just look at like an outcome and then see what socioeconomic status this group has or individual has rather than taking a group, tracking them over a long period of time. So that wouldn't be the best type of study. Option C, a case control study. So this is when you look at some particular case. For example, someone might have a low health ex or low life expectancy and then you compare that to someone who has a high life expectancy or something else and then so you have two groups right you have the group you're looking at you have a control and then you're retroactively or retrospectively going back and looking at like what characteristics the group had or what socioeconomic status they had this you don't really have to do because we're not really looking at a certain case we're not looking at Oh, does someone have a low life expectancy or do they have a high and is this specifically linked to some socioeconomic status? We're just saying, can we find any association between these two variables? So a case control study might be more applicable for something like a patient gets cancer, there's cancer, pa cancer patients and a group without cancer and then go back and see what variables or what things they were exposed to that might have led to the disease. But that's when you have a more specific case in mind and we don't have anything too specific, we're just looking for an association. So D would be the strongest answer. A cross-sectional study, it looks at the prevalence of a condition across different groups at a point in time. So you can look at the health status, which you're looking at by looking at the life expectancy of people across multiple categories of socioeconomic status. So we have picked our point in time, we look at these people here, and then look at the health status of the people. This gives us a wide range of socioeconomic status that we're looking at and a wide range of results we get in terms of life expectancy and the health outcomes as well. And then we can compile this data together and then draw an association between the two. In question 68, we're asked which of the following describes rods but not cones. So something that describes rods 
not cones. So these are photosensor cells in the eye and rods you need to keep in mind. They are more sensitive than cones and there are more of them present. They're more numerous. So rods are responsible for low light vision and peripheral vision and cones are responsible for color vision and high acuity vision. Ashin A is saying rods are less sensitive to light than cones are. This is incorrect because rods are actually more sensitive. So at night, your cones can't really pick up. Like if it's at night and it's dark in your room, your cones can't really pick up light. Whereas your rods, which are more sensitive, they need fewer photons to be excited. Those can pick up light. And you're mainly using your rods to view things at night. And that's why things can appear black and white because rods don't, don't visualize color, whereas cones are responsible for color. So rods are more sensitive. B is saying rods are less numerous than cones. No, there are more rods in the eye than cones. C is saying rods produce images perceived with good visual acuity. No, they're actually much poorer in terms of visual acuity. Cones have higher visual acuity. And finally, D is correct. Rods are responsible for peripheral vision because they are present on the sides, whereas cones are not. And because of that, cones aren't really playing a part in peripheral vision. Option, or question 69 is saying, during the colonization of Rwanda, two racial classes, the Tutsis and the Hutus, were redefined along new boundaries, including social, and social status and physical features. This imposition of racial divides is an example of what? So you're imposing a racial divide. You're doing something along new boundaries. The key thing here is that. So the term which best describes this would be option B, Racial, racialization, which is creating new race groups which didn't exist before based on whatever factors, in this case, they're looking at social status and physical features. Prejudice, these are held beliefs by an individual based on what they have heard about or learned, but not something which they've firsthandly experienced, not based on firsthand experience. So these preconceived notions as for prejudices and things like prejudice, ethnocentrism, and racism play a part in how local populations are treated in colonization. But we're talking more specifically about creating a new race when one did not exist before, that is racialization. And just to explain them, um, so racism would be a more direct form of prejudice, which is specifically prejudice against people based on their race. And ethnocentrism is judging a different culture based on the values that you have within your own instead of judging a culture based on their values. So as an outsider versus an insider. But those are incorrect, B is the best answer. In question 70, it says, with respect to sound, which of the following would be expected to have the lowest decibel for a particular individual? So which one would have the lowest decibel level? So for this, you have to understand what, you, what each of these are. And then from there, you can figure out which one is the lowest decibel level. The absolute threshold, that is defining the threshold at which you can first even hear or even detect that you're hearing a sound. So it's a minimal level that a particular human ear, that a human ear can pick up. Of course, it varies between individuals, but for generally the human ear, the absolute threshold for a given person is the lowest decibel which they can pick up. Option B, recognition threshold. This is the threshold it must reach before you can recognize what that sound is. Maybe you can recognize like what the source of the sound is. It's coming from this type of origin. This you can logic out would be higher than the absolute threshold. Option C, the differential threshold. This is when you can detect a difference between two of the same stimuli. So if you're getting you know, one stimulus, auditory stimulus at a given decibel level, how much does that decibel level have to change between you can tell between A and B, there's a difference in intensity or the loudness of the sound. And finally, D, the terminal threshold, that's the highest decibel level that and the, in this individual's ear can even detect. After that, it's not a range which the, which the ears can even pick up. It's, you know, ultrasonic. So, yeah. All of these are much higher. A would be the lowest decibel level because this is the lowest level you can even detect. So A is the correct answer here. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description below. In that course, we go through questions just like we did here and go through all the different answer explanations so that you have the right type of thinking for the MCAT. 
We also have lecture videos delivered by students that are in medical school, and we can provide you with a customized MCAT schedule. To see what else we offer, check out the link, and here are some reviews for our course. That's it for this particular video. Make sure to subscribe here to stay up to date with what we post here, and I will see you guys in the next video.